Welcome to my presentation, Does My Patient Have Asthma or Is It Something Else? My name is Terrence Shenfield and I am the co-owner of a and Respiratory Lectures. And I'm bringing you this presentation because many times patients will come into the emergency room presenting with asthma symptoms, but it very likely could be something else. So I wanted to do a little bit of education on this for you so you learn a little bit more about recognizing asthma versus not asthma. So I wanted to present a brief case study of admission in the ER. A EMS brings this three-year-old girl to the emergency room who was complaining of coughing and trouble breathing for the last two days. Uh, the symptoms include wheezing, runny nose, and actually when you did an assessment of her, you noted moderate respiratory distress with suprasternal and intercostal retractions. The vital signs were her respiratory rate was 40 breaths per minute, her heart rate was 120, the temperature was just about 101. It wasn't really a high temperature, but it was just about 101. And her pulse oximetry showed 93% on room air. They did an x-ray and when they did the x-ray, it was non-specific. They really couldn't find anything particularly wrong in the x-ray. So that is our case. And so you're wondering what's going on with her. You know, um, she has these retractions. She does have wheezing. Is it asthma? Is it something else? How do you know? What do you do? A lot of times patients like this will immediately be given a bronchodilator, which may not be a problem at all, but a lot of times their long-term treatment could be given a bronchodilator, maybe in a corticosteroid too. But you really have to determine whether the patient have asthma or not, or could it be something else that looks like asthma? The objectives for today's presentations, I'm going to talk about describing other medical conditions that appear to be asthma. I'm also going to be describing some of the pathophysiology of different conditions that actually mimic asthma. So, you know, you have wheezing, you have retractions, you have shortness of breath. Is it asthma? We don't know. We're going to be talking about di describing differential diagnosis with asthma. And then we're also going to be talking about some basic treatment options for the condition the patient has. The whole point of this presentation is that just because someone wheezes doesn't necessarily mean they have asthma. Um, I'll tell you a story a little bit later about myself. Um, when I was in my 30s, I was starting to wheeze. And as a brand new respiratory therapist, I actually became a respiratory therapist at the age about 37. Uh, that was my second career. I used to be on Wall Street, but that's another story. But long story short, I've never wheezed in my whole life. And at 37 years old, I was starting to wheeze and I was starting to get shortness of breath. And I could have swore I had asthma and I did the best job of convincing my primary care physician that I did have asthma. And he put me on some albuterol, he put me on some um, corticosteroids, and really I was using this twice a day and I was sort of still having breakthroughs with it. Um, long story short, after about three years, I was talking to a physician friend of mine and he says, Terry, he says, did you ever consider that maybe you have GERD? And I thought to myself, I don't think so. I never had GERD. But he says, you know, sometimes that can really mask itself as asthma. And then I started paying attention. I realized that sometimes after I ate, and I never paid attention to this before, but sometimes after I ate, I would be wheezing. And so long story short, I ended up going to the doctor, the GI doctor in particular, and it turns out I did have GERD. So they offered me um, some medication uh, for my Nexium to be exact. They offered me Nexium. I started taking it and asthma symptoms were gone. 
So I self-treated myself. I didn't really self-treat. My doctor prescribed me medications, but I was under the assumption I had asthma and I was on a treatment regimen for three years with the corticosteroids, with albuterol, wheezing here and there. Meanwhile, my problem was something else but I did such a good job of convincing my primary care physician what was going on with me. So that's where this lecture is really important. It really sort of going to speak to the fact that don't assume all wheezing is asthma. In this particular presentation, I was talking about the case study of a three-year-old girl who comes into the emergency room. So I want to focus this particular asthma lecture on a pediatric population. So a lot of times you may think a patient may have asthma and they may be wheezing and they got retractions and they got such and such, but really, do they have asthma? And some of these conditions you see right in front of you can mask itself for a significant period of time. You may think you have asthma symptoms or you may think you're patient or your family member has asthma when they don't. It could be foreign body obstruction. Pediatric children are famous for swallowing little toys and you never know it. They can have this little bit of an inspiratory or expiratory wheeze due to the obstruction. A laryngotracheomalacia, this is a congenital disorder where a lot of patients have narrowing of the vocal cords causing wheezing. I just talked about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. You know, I'm the perfect example. Can it happen in children? Absolutely can happen in children. You got cystic fibrosis. A lot of times patients are not actually diagnosed with cystic fibrosis till later on in life. And then when, you know, they have asthma-like symptoms and that can mask itself as asthma also croup, you know, patients come in to, you know, especially with the young kids, they get croup. They got this balking cough. They got this inspiratory wheeze. They got a bunch of things. They got strider, so on. Bronchiolitis, another condition that could mask itself as asthma. And RSV, you know, we just had a big outbreak with RSV just recently here in 2023. And RSV, absolutely going to wheeze. And I have a whole lecture I talk about RSV in adults, but this is not about adults. But when you talk about RSV, wheezing is a very prominent factor with this particular disease condition. So we're going to get into each of these with a little bit more detail, and then we're going to go a little bit more about the treatment options. So this way you could recognize patients who potentially may have a condition outside the world of asthma. This is an interesting case. It's foreign body obstruction. Basically, the likelihood of a young child swallowing some kind of toy or a peanut or some kind of other object is very, very high. Most likely, it could be seeds, it could be peanuts, it could be food particles, it could even be toys, it could be marbles, it could be a whole host of things. And a lot of times, these patients who do swallow that don't really are not very symptomatic initially, but then they might develop into a wheeze. So you really have to have a differential diagnosis going on with a patient who comes in with a wheeze who never really had a family history of asthma, the parents don't have asthma, and all of a sudden they, they have a quick onset of asthma where they start wheezing and so on. A lot of times when these aspirated particles go into the airway, it leads to inflammation and edema in acute stage. Um, according to the National Safety Council statistics, foreign body airway obstruction is the fourth leading cause of unintentional death resulting in over 5,000 deaths in the year 2015. So a lot of times, um, how do you know if someone has an obstruction? You need to do an x-ray. And what is the treatment option? Sometimes a simple Heimlich maneuver can be taught to a patient and it's often proven to save lives. Sometimes if it gets down to a point that you're not recognizing that the kid swallowed anything, 
you might have to do flexible bronchoscopy. So let me just do a little bit of explanation of the images on the right. These were a case study where this child actually aspirated a little toy um, almost 18 months prior to the x-ray. Soon after the aspiration of the toy, um, they actually noticed he was shortness of breath. And what they did is they ended up putting the kid on some antibiotics and they also started some bronchodilators, albuterol syrup. Um, after a while, the asthma never resolved. It was just getting progressively worse and he was having inflammation and he was coughing and such and such. And they ended up bringing him back into the hospital. And when they did the x-ray, you notice that on the right side of the lung, you have this hyperinflation going on versus the left side. The reason for that is the toy lodged into the right bronchus. So you had this little toy in the right bronchus. It created this one-way valve. Hyperinflation came into the right lung because of that. When you did the x-ray, it's pretty clear about what's going on there. They had to use flexible bronchoscopy on that patient. So the point what I'm saying is that, you know, just because the kid comes in with wheezing and this kid was treated for 18 months as an asthmatic when they didn't recognize this was the real problem here. So you always got to think about foreign body obstruction, the likelihood of swallowing food of some kind of seed or food particle or toys or whatever. And you have to look at that. And as the data shows, you know, it was the fourth leading to cause of death um, for this particular age group. And so that's kind of scary. We all have heard the relationship between sinusitis and rhinitis with asthmatic patients. Many times patients who have rhinitis, which basically is um, allergic reaction to some kind of allergen. Sinusitis is basically inflammatory process due to that inflammation, but they go hand in hand. And the funny part is that uh, nearly half of the people who are diagnosed with asthma also have some form of rhinitis or sinusitis. So if you control that, if you give some kind of uh, uh, flow nase for the nose and you decrease the inflammation or if you use HEPA filters at home and you don't breathe in the pollen, these patients greatly benefit. So like I said, nearly half of the individuals with moderate to severe asthma also have sinusitis and basically if you manage that, you take away uh, the problem. But this also leaves half of the people who just have an allergic reaction in their nose who don't necessarily have asthma. And the reason why you might have asthma symptoms is because this leads to post-nasal drip, especially at night. So patients at night um, who have these allergic responses to allergens end up um, you know, post-nasal drip and it goes down into the airway, which causes all kinds of coughing and inflammation and wheezing sometimes. Also, asthmatics with sinusitis are more likely to have nasal polyps than non-asthmatics. So you really got to uh, learn that. Another thing is if you control the rhinitis, you're going to greatly improve the asthma symptoms. So someone can be a moderately to severe asthmatic, but if you control the symptoms of rhinitis, uh, you're doing well. Problem is many patients may not have asthma. They may have strictly rhinitis. And if you treat the rhinitis, you will eliminate the possibility of asthma. You don't need a bronchodilator. You don't need any kind of cortical steroid. So a lot of these patients are misdiagnosed. So whenever someone has rhinitis, make sure that if you treat them and the rhinitis is, is resolved and they don't have asthmatic symptoms, they don't need asthma medications. And so that's the driving point what I'm talking about right now. This is another interesting case that could be um, mistaken for asthma. It's called laryngotracheomalacia. And I wanted to talk about this because there was a case study of a 22-year-old girl who had childhood asthma, 
And as she got older, the asthma got progressively worse and so did her step up treatment to manage the asthma. Uh, one day they actually brought her to the emergency room because she was really having a lot of inspiratory stridor, which is a little different for asthma. Typically asthma has expiratory stridor, but whatever the case is, they did a laryngeal fibroscopic exam and they found out that she had laryngeal tracheomalacia. So basically she was being treated with asthma medications when in reality she had some problem with her, her tracheal tissue. So what is laryngeal tracheomalacia? Typically it's a congenital disorder where it's softening of the tissues of the larynx, which is above the vocal cords. Typically it resolves itself in time. So as the child gets older, you're born with this congenital disorder. And as the child gets older, they actually improve because, you know, airway gets a little bit larger. But uh, sometimes they found that these patients, you know, even though it resolved, they got some structural changes to the larynx that could actually cause inspiratory stridor. So the hallmark sign to this type of disorder is inspiratory stridor. So these are the kind of things you have to look out for. A lot of times when someone has a respiratory infection, this particular system gets a lot worse. So you'll have the increased inspiratory stridor. And even if you take a bronchodilator or corticosteroids, it's not going to resolve the issue because it's not in the airway, it's in the upper airway by the larynx. A lot of times you need to do a surgical intervention. And um, those are the cases where you, you know, you have improvement. Regarding that case study of the, the young girl who came into the emergency room, she actually had surgical intervention and she greatly improved. She didn't even need her asthma medications anymore because that was the underlying problem. So this is something you should be aware about that whenever you talk about, um, you know, inspiratory stridor and you assume it's asthma, you got to take a little bit deeper look. So this is another one of those conditions. As I was mentioning at the beginning, I have GERD and I misdiagnosed myself as having asthma and I kept on an asthma regimen almost three years as a result of uh, thinking I had asthma. But in reality, I had GERD and then when the doctor ordered the Nexium for me, I was all cured. So this is a very common way to misdiagnose asthma. How it works is there's a sphincter in your stomach that controls the amount of food that goes up through the esophagus. It should be a one-way tube, but sometimes that sphincter is loose or it's open and acid particles can move up through the esophagus and get aspirated or food particles sometimes could and then again be as, um, aspirated. So aspiration of acid particles in the trachea can cause coughing, wheezing, and even pneumonia. And also acid in the esophagus causes a reflux, uh, reflex, I'm sorry, reflex, that can trigger asthma-like symptoms. So when you think about it, GERD is one of the three most common causes of chronic cough in children, along with post-nasal drip and asthma. Remember, we were talking about post-nasal drip. You know, that could be another one. So um, a lot of times GERD is mostly influenced after you eat or if you go to bed, like if you have a meal and then you go to bed like within an hour after eating and you happen to have uh, GERD, that is a time where you can wake up coughing and things like that. The treatment option for this is actually to give you some kind of um, an Exium product. Uh, you know, I think it's called a um, H2 inhibitor. So basically those are the type of treatment options you need to do for GERD. A lot of times GERD could be mistaken for asthma. Another condition that mimics asthma is cystic fibrosis. No, but cystic fibrosis is a lot worse than asthma. But 
cystic fibrosis patients wheeze. There's no question about that. It's uh, basically a multi-system autosomal recessive disease that leads to progressive loss of lung function. Um, the typical signs and symptoms of cystic fibrosis patients is a cough, is a wheeze, is shortness of breath, is recurrent respiratory infections. It's diagnosed through a sweat test. So really, if you have a patient who's wheezing and you suspect the family history of cystic fibrosis within the family, you should absolutely um, get a sweat test to determine that. The pathogenesis of airway obstruction and wheezing with the cystic patient involves several overlapping mechanisms. It involves airway mucosal edema, due to chronic infection and inflammation. It also has mechanical obstruction due to thick secretions. Um, these are many of the dif difficulties along with cystic. It also stimulates a host of inflammatory mediators and it can result in dynamic collapse of the airway. So cystic fibrosis is really bad. You're gonna wheeze and uh, you can't just treat cystic fibrosis with albuterol and um, some kind of corticosteroid. So as I was mentioning, you really want to get a, a sweat test on this patient. And here's another fact. 37% of patients with cystic fibrosis also have asthma. So you can have both conditions within the patient and you have to treat you have to treat both conditions. So that's a little bit about something about cystic fibrosis. So you think your patient has asthma. So let me test your ability to understand the difference between asthma and croup, because you should be able to recognize the difference. With croup, is it an inspiratory problem or is it an expiratory problem? And the answer is, it's an inspiratory problem. So if you have inspiratory strider, there's a good chance you have croup. What about age? What about what age factor comes into play? And most of the time, if you're up to the ages of zero to three years of age, that is another indication for croup. What about family history? Is there any kind of genetic component to understanding croup? And absolutely, there is a genetic component to croup. Some families are more susceptible to having croup-like symptoms than other families. So these are some of the takeaways you have with croup. And I have more on the next slide. So with croup, it's a common childhood illness that causes swelling of the upper airway. So basically, during the larynx, that area gets swelling and it gets constricted and you end up having this barking sound or cough. So they, a lot of times they say, when you have someone has croup, they have like a seal-like bark. Also, it's caused by um, viruses. So it could be a host of viruses that cause it, but the parainfluenza virus is the most common. Another common occurrence with croup is strider. Strider occurs when inspiratory, you have inspiratory strider, and you could treat it with a cool mist aerosol, or if you're in severe cases, you need to use some racemic epinephrine. So this is how you can manage croup and how you can recognize croup versus asthma is because of an inspiratory strider, maybe a family history, uh, maybe they just got over some kind of um, influenza virus or something like that, and they have inflammation occurring as a result of that. So that's how you can understand croup. Bronchiolitis is an infection of the lower respiratory tract. It typically impacts young children, and typically these children can be treated at home most of the time. Um, a lot of times it is caused by some kind of virus and sometimes you could get a common cold, but then this common cold gets worse and they end up having these high pitched whistling sounds, which can be mistaken for an asthmatic wheeze. Basically these children, 
can get better anywhere from one to two weeks, but sometimes it can last a lot longer. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about bronchiolitis and the inflammation it causes. And also, um, there's a lot of mucus in the airways, and that's part of the reason why you hear the wheezing sound. These are some of the common characteristics of bronchiolitis. Typically, the first episode occurs anywhere from 12 to 24 months of age. Uh, they don't have any kind of history of asthma, but they may have had a viral respiratory infection that have occurred um, prior to the signs and symptoms of it. A broader definition is anyone who's less than two years of age has wheezing, airway obstruction, as a result of a primary or reinfection resulting in inflammation of the bronchioles, which actually results in mucus production in the bronchioles causing a wheeze. Regarding the microbiology of bronchiolitis, it's typically caused by a viral infection rather than a bacterial infection. So typically, you will not be given any kind of antibiotic to the child unless they have a secondary bacterial infection. The number one cause of bronchiolitis is the RSV virus. So the RSV virus is the most common cause, and that could be followed up by the parainfluenza virus, it could be the influenza virus, it could be the adenovirus, it could be the rhinovirus, it could be the coronavirus. All of these things can cause bronchiolitis, and bronchiolitis is inflammation of the lower airways with increased mucus production, and you can actually get a lot of wheezing going along with that. Let's turn our attention to the RSV virus in particular. As you all know, the RSV virus is a very common virus that probably over 90% of us have been exposed to during our life. We probably have multiple exposures, but RSV virus in itself is a virus that is um, predominantly uh, quite spreadable because it's very contagious. Uh, when the patient sheds the viral shedding and they sneeze and they cough and they got secretions, those secretions are loaded with um, the RSV virus. RSV virus, when we first get it, we build up a partial immunity, but we really don't eradicate the virus. We don't build up an immunity that we could just block it for life. RSV is also a very common cause of bronchiolitis, like I mentioned earlier, and it actually breaks out during flu season. So RSV comes around the same time as you get the flu, and sometimes you may not know if you got the flu, if you got an RSV infection, or if you have, um, you know, whatever. But bottom line, with RSV infections, you're definitely going to wheeze. So you can't assume you have asthma just because you're wheezing with RSV. So this is another type of medical condition that could be, dis you may think you have asthma, but in reality, you have a different infection. In this case, it happens to be RSV. As I was mentioning, the epidemiology is that RSV typically impacts infants who are less than two years of age. Um, it can happen anytime during the ages of two to six months of age. It can definitely lead to hospitalizations because you got to think about it, young children, uh, infants and um, young children and little kids, their airways are very narrow. And when they get the inflammation caused by the RSV infection, it can lead to bronchiolitis, it can lead to pneumonia, it can lead to a bunch of different, different conditions. So reality is RSV can be quite severe. Also, RSV is extremely contagious. And like I said, you build up a partial immunity. So a child may get it, you know, at three, three months of age, and then all of a sudden they get it another at six months of age. And as each time goes on, they build up a little bit better immunity, but they never can eradicate the virus itself. Some of the major risk factors for RSV infection is prematurity. So if babies are born less than 37 weeks of gestation, they have a partial immunity. So in other words, their immune system, their antioxidant system is not fully geared up and they can get really sick. 
Low birth weight goes along with pre, pre, uh, prematurity. Um, if you're less than six to 12 weeks of age, again, you have an in, uh, incomplete immune system and you can end up um, you know, getting sick. Chronic pulmonary disease, think of bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease. These kids are more susceptible to RSV infections. And remember, RSV infections look just like asthma because you're wheezing up a storm. It could also happen if you have congenital heart disease and patients who are immunodeficient, they are a uh, high risk too, obviously. The pathogenesis of RSV infections is that it penetrates the terminal bronchioepithelial cells and it has direct damage and inflammation in the small bronchi and bronchioles. So, you know, you get a lot of inflammation, you get a lot of excessive mucus, you get edema. It actually um, damages the epithelial cells, the cilia on the epithelial cells, which actually causes obstruction of small airways, and it can lead to atelectasis. So RSV can have a severe impact on your lung function, and could actually, you know, wheezing is just part of it, but you could also see this other damage occurring too. So let's talk about some pharmacologic therapy for RSV infections. Should we give bronchodilators? Should we give albuterol? Should we give epinephrine? Do they work? Should we give oral bronchodilators? And the answer is, it can sometimes work. You could first start off with an albuterol treatment, see if it decreases the wheezing, see if it decreases the work of breathing. Um, you could also give corticosteroids to the patient who have chronic disease or like an asthma-like component. Uh, would you use rib ribavirin? No, currently it's not recommended for children with RSV. So managing RSV with a bronchodilator, you could if it results in an improvement in air function. Uh, would you give a corticosteroid? Yeah, if it benefits the patient, especially if they got some kind of asthma-like component. Would you give ribavirin? Absolutely not. There's no proven uh, efficacy of giving ribavirin to children with um, RSV infections. I wanted to summarize some of the findings for the use of inhaled bronchodilators with RSV infections. Should you try it? Yes. Um, how are the studies? The studies have been varied. Some have shown it works, some have shown it hasn't worked. So with that being said, if you have someone with severe wheezing who's an RSV patient, you should try albuterol. And if, and then assess the patient. If the patient is doing well, you can continue the therapy. If they're not doing well, discontinue it. You could also do that with epinephrine. If the patient has no kind of response within the first hour, you know, uh, don't continue it. So basically, it, if it works, continue it. And if it doesn't work, uh, DC it. And that's because the studies out with it have not been that supportive with its use. And that is why I mentioned that just the way I do. So let's continue the talk on adjunctive therapy for RSV infections. How about Heliox? Heliox has been shown to reduce the respiratory distress in the first hour after starting the therapy. So it really has done a pretty good job with bronchiolitis and it also has done a very good job with RSV infections. Now, which one should you use? Should you do the 70, 80% or 20, 30%? It doesn't matter. It sort of says it really doesn't make a big difference which mixture you use, either a 70 or a 30%, because the results have been the same. What about um, anti-RSV preparations such as Synergis? Synergis is basically a, um, a vaccine. So yes, it has been shown to work for patients who have severe RSV infections. So if you have a child who has severe RSV infections, it behooves you 
to get them with a vaccine on board. And Synergist is a very good choice to do it. Uh, but if you have mild to moderate RSV infections, I wouldn't bother. How about surfactant? Yes, surfactant has been shown to work very well with patients with RSV infections. Um, a lot of studies have shown deficiencies in surfactant with patients with severe RSV. So yes, it is a good choice. And hypertonic saline is the same thing. How does hypertonic saline work? There's good evidence on it. It shows that it actually um, it mobilizes and reduces the amount of mucus in the airway, which improves breathing. So all of these therapies have been shown to work, and you really got to consider it by case by case basis. So in summary. I wanted to let you know that the whole purpose of this presentation is that all wheezing doesn't equate to asthma. And so you really have to have a differential diagnosis with every patient because you can't assume just because they're wheezing that they got asthma. Uh, many patients have different disease processes, so you really need to identify with a good diagnosis what's going on with them. And you also need to not treat patients with things that don't necessarily work. So, and also, you know, as I mentioned, some of the adjunct therapies that were out there, they seem to be quite promising in the research. So, you know, think about use, utilizing them as one of your tools in these cases. And I want to thank you all for joining my presentation. I hope you learned a lot from it. And I'm hoping that to see you again. I have a nice group of references for you right here. These are some very good studies that support the evidence that I just presented. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I wish you all a great day.